Now, one of the fun things about the United States during subprime is at the height of the crisis in August of 2007, the FDIC chair, the Treasury Secretary, and the Federal Reserve chair all crowded around a two-top in a bar in Washington, and over the course of about a 45-minute conversation, worked out the bare bones of what eventually became TARP, which was our restitution program for subprime. And that was the model that we followed until the end of the crisis. And it said, in a very American terms, that if you f***ed up, you lose. So whether you were the lender or the lendee, there were losses taken. The government money was only there for people to reconstitute. And if you made a mistake, you didn't get everything back. It was something to stabilize the financial sector, not bail out individuals or corporations. And broadly speaking, it worked. Now, the Australians did something very similar in when they set up their restitution program, but they didn't call anyone to an account. Every mortgage was backed at 100%. Furthermore, they changed the laws. So if you could prove that you could pay your mortgage with a 100% government guarantee, you automatically qualified for a second mortgage and a third. And a fourth, they haven't had their adjustment yet. And when they do, oh my God. Prime Minister Modi adopted something very similar to what the Australians did, but you only got the money if you were one of his friends. <laughs> and here are the Chinese. Let me adjust this for you. Are you? kidding me. <laughs> How anyone thinks that China is a serious player on the international playground is beyond me. We are looking at the equivalent of Enron in the 11th hour. The question is, when it falls, what does it do? I'm not really worried about it from a strategic point of view. They can't really reach anyone. I'd be a little nervous I was in Taiwan, obviously but I'm more worried about the economic consequences, and we're starting to see the kind of faint outlines of what that's gonna look like, so good and bad. Let's start with the good. I'm not worried about finance, and that's courtesy, ironically, of the Russians. When the Ukraine war started, every Western financial institution cut their exposure to Russian banks to zero. The Chinese flooded into the space to take over, and that meant that every Western institution was like, whoa, that's like screaming for sanctions. We should probably cut our connections to the Chinese as well. And here we are a year and a half into the war, and the total exposure of all Western banks to all Chinese banks is less than 1% of their global holdings. That's a happy circumstance. I like that. I'm also not worried about merchandise exports to the Chinese because it's a very protectionist system. They build anything they possibly can. They import as little as they can which means that the total exposure, the entire world to the Chinese consumer is only about 3.5% of Chinese GDP, which is the lowest goods exposure of any country today. It's not zero, but it's manageable. If you're in the world of commodities, different situation. It's investment driven, building things that they don't need. So whether it's copper or steel or aluminum, they are the world's largest player, often the world's largest importer. And even if we have to rebuild a lot of industrial plant in other places, the industrial plant we build in other places is going to be based on economics and efficiency rather than just build. We're not going to need as much. And so those sectors are going to have some serious downward adjustments. Food's kind of in the middle. The Chinese are the world's largest importer of almost every food product. Their diet has expanded massively in the last 35 years. And that is probably going to break down, but consider this. The last thing a government does before it collapses is somehow take steps to restrict the population's access to food. So of the things that are gonna break, it's probably the last one to go, and it'll be a little bit of a softer landing because you know we still need food. Tech's gonna be an issue. The Chinese are not technically advanced. Most of what they do in manufacturing is relatively low value and they bring in tech from everyone they can to build that industrial plant. And in terms of tech supply chains, they tend to be on the assembly side of things with more advanced stuff coming from Taiwan, Thailand, Korea, and the rest. That whole ecosystem 
is going to end. And there aren't enough fingers and eyes in the world to do assembly on the scale we've become used to. And that's going to probably be what hurts us most of all. Well, this is a document from the American Enterprise Institute on Inflation. The yellow arrows are the average inflation since the year 2000, so roughly a 75% increase in inflation over the 22 years. Everything that is below that line has gotten cheaper. Everything above that line has gotten more expensive. Oversimplifying here, but above the line, those are the things that require fingers and eyes. Healthcare, for example, requires people. There's no way around that and everything below it is something you plug into the world that beeps and oars something that's manufactured and the sign is a critical component of all of that the biggest hole we are going to have when the sign is go is the complex supply chains in the world of electronics is going to have to find a new way to put things together and we haven't developed a new model for that in 60 years and we are going to have to now that doesn't mean it's going to be a disaster because one of the many things we found out about COVID is that the technology that we have had in pocket for years suddenly can be used at scale. I think the best example I can give you is textile. Big Sorry, back before NAFTA, most of our textile processing was in places like Kentucky where it was done by hand. And then NAFTA happened and it all moved to Mexico because it was cheaper. And then the WTO happened and it all moved to China and India because it was cheaper. But with COVID, it just stopped coming and we still went at clothes. So we had to figure out a different method. And we discovered that if you will, a two echo facility that automated with a staff of two. One software engineer one a mechanic that one facility could produce finished clothes at a lower cost per garment than 200 semesters in Bangladesh. You bring in the cotton, the machines turn it into the trade, you turn it into yarn, turn it into cloth, cut it into clothes, assemble it even to some of the finishing. We would have never known that before. 2022, hopefully, we will figure things like that out in other sectors. But that means we need a lot of investment and an era of constraint capital in order to happen at a scale in every single manufacturing sector. We have a start, the blue line is what happened with the shell sector. About 2012, that is when the majority of the natural gas consumed on this continent came from shell. A lot of that's waste gas. And so we trivial our investment in a couple years and it hasn't fallen back. The refining sector, the chemical effects that are all expanding very quickly is actually the biggest build we have seen ever in the history of the country. Faster than World War II. The grave is kind of the everything else category and it's sliding up. We'll notice that in the last couple years it's picked up a quite bit. This is where we are all noticing it though. This is electronics and computing. Now a lot of people are like, isn't this all the IRA and the SIPS Act? And that's some of it. Can I even get back here? Okay. This is for right here. That's where the SIPS Act and the IRA were passed. So all of this happened before the industry. The industrial based in expanding significantly. But we need that kind of Zeka for absolutely everything. There will be winners and losers. There's no way around that. On the high end. If you went to semiconductor fab facility, you need a lot of people in their 20s and 30s who are really clever. And the greatest concentration of those people in the country is the Colorado Fond Rains and the Arizona Sun Quater. I know everybody thinks about Arizona. And they think old people. They do have a lot of old people in Arizona. However, they all white. Okay, thank you for watching Geopolitics Results.